Hey everyone, greetings and welcome to another episode of John and Roman Solve the World's Problems. That is a lie. So tonight we're going to be talking about movie scores and movie soundtracks. And I know Comic-Con is going on. So a lot of people are watching Comic-Con stuff tonight and I can't fault you for that. I can only hate you a little bit but it's still there. Um, anyway, so John, how are you doing this fine evening? Well, it's not quite the weekend, but um, it's close. I've made it this far, and I have an open beer, so I'm doing pretty good right about now. How are you doing, Roman? <laughs> well, that's better than I, I am. I'm I'm all right. You know, uh, as always, we are we are fighting the the technical woes of the of the Empire Studio because that's all part of the experience. Uh, see, the nerdporeal life form is in the house along with Rosie, um, and it's good to see you guys out there. Thanks for showing up. So, um, before we get started into our primary uh, item tonight, I did want to talk very very briefly about this. Eric July went over three million dollars today, and congratulations to the Ripaverse. This is Jeez. a great story for so many reasons. Um, he he is showing the industry what can be done, and what people want. people are like, oh, well, you know, if you got this whole crowdfunding, and he's like, no, no, no. It's all started with 200000 of his money, and then everything since then has been through purchases. Dude has 64 days to go, and he's over $3 million, and I am so happy. So, Nerdporeal, you, yeah, you know, and I, I think we see this, let's see if that's going to work. There we go. But I bought a copy of the standard version. So I bought, I bought the... Uh, the non-autographed uh, cover A, uh, because I'm only a poor corrupt official. But then I saw that he had hats available, oh and boy. then uh, Mrs. of the Empire encouraged me to get a hat. Wow. So okay. um, I, I, I now am into it for a hat and a comic book so far, and uh, I, I can't say I'm unhappy. I'm happy to contribute to something like this. Yes. Uh, because it does, it's 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 not just Eric July. This is a punch at the industry, and this is the hope for the building of something better. Well, and I I feel like it's not so much. I mean, it is, but I don't feel like it's so much of like a punch like against something. So much as trying to show like this is what the fans want. You know, stop pandering to the people who didn't really buy your product to begin with stop putting out this woke nonsense of social justice whatever and it's like just make good characters and good stories that people are interested in and want to read about so i i, I don't think it's a punch down on anyone so much as it's like this is what people want because I, I did I the saw same a couple thing. Things. I went and I just Oops, I I'm just sorry. ordered the the cover A generic because I'm also just a, a humble poor machinist, but I, I bought just the cover A. And I'm not the biggest comic book fan in the world, but this I'm like, I want to get behind this. I want to be a part of this. So um, I see that Alex uh, Mr. AWK is in the house. Um so you obviously have insomnia. That was my warning to, to you guys. He's one of my uh, my friends from the other side of the pond that uh, uh, we cheers, do a broadcast friend. on Saturday. So thank you for joining me. Um, get, you need to get some sleep, brother. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, I saw some stuff coming out of Comic-Con today. And... <sighs> The X-Men aren't the X-Men anymore. The X-Men are the oh mutants Lord, because you it. can't call them men. Because, you know, 
And then Blade, and this isn't really even woke, it's just stupid. Blade is now going to be the Blade. What difference it's does his, that make? It's his name. His name is Blade. That'd like be calling me the Roman, or you are the John. That is the stupid. Why? Well, why? I mean, that's that's why? just that's gonna be what I'm gonna start calling you now. Is that you are just the Roman? God damn it! See, I immediately regret bringing this up. This it's things like this that are gonna bring this situation to a head. And so. Save that clip. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we are, our big topic of the night, and this is the one that I'm. I'm pretty excited. John's not, not a super. Dear God damn it. Save that clip. That's not funny. Hey, Corey. Um, I think it's when my computer's transitioning, when I'm trying to bring up stuff on the other computer that it's doing this. I mean, I should know better, but yet, here we are. So, um, the, the main topic of tonight. <laughs> and I can't even drink because I have to, I'm, I'm, I got too much, I got to do later. So, um, scores and soundtracks. Yes. So, the right music not only can help enhance the movie experience, it can hang in there with you for a while, sometimes very long after the credits have rolled. And once you hear that music again, it instantly transports you back to that place when the movie was right in front of you. It takes you mentally to another place. And that's what good scores and soundtracks do. And there are a ton of good scores. And this is something we could probably talk a very long time about. And we've gone through and picked uh, a few. And if you guys have any other suggestions, please throw them at us while we're talking about this. Because this is, I think, just a very fun topic. So the one that I picked first, and this, this, this movie is, is, is very, very close to me, The Thing. So the soundtrack is from Ernie O'Marconi, who did... All of those spaghetti western movies that you are so familiar with, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Fistful of Dollars, all of those movies were have this man's musical stamp on them. And then he does the thing. And it is very different than all of that stuff. He's a he's a he's a great composer and he writes for the piece. He doesn't just write, have his his style of writing, he changes things. He also did the 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 uh the Unbels, if you'll remember that, with Kevin Costner and Robert De Niro all those years ago. But these things had just really specific, it's almost like a heartbeat when the movie is starting and the dog is running across the ice and the helicopter mm. is chasing him. And as soon as you hear that, you know right where you are. And I, I never knew the titles of these pieces of music, and I, and I, and I, I copied them all down as Humanity, Shape, c Contamination, Bestiality. Oh my! Oh boy! Solitude, uh, eternity, wait, humanity part two, sterilization and despair. Ooh. Now, that is that's not a happy sounding list. Um, actually, John Carpenter was involved in parts of the music for this as well. Uh, Nerd Poriel, you are correct in that. So, and, now, and this just, was collaboration, though. Go ahead. Just real quick, not to cut you up, check your uh, the private chat there on uh, StreamYard. I believe we have oh. a message in there. Oh, 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 oh. Are you, I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't... How can, uh, You're not there anymore. Oh, maybe we lost him. Oh, uh, there you are. Let me bring you on, Alec. Hello. Sorry about this, but um, I'm operating off my phone tonight because my internet's failed. Connection? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the internet's failed in, the, in my area, and I'm not in a happy mood about it. I was so looking forward to this. You know? I, I do apologize. 
Yes, Juan. Well, welcome to the show. I'm I'm uh, I'm very happy to have you. I'm I'm, I'm amazed that you decided to do, uh, stay up. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm not staying around uh, for very much long because I don't know how much data my phone's going to be eating up thanks to the internet <laughs> not working. Ah, I do understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, yes, I am pretty familiar with uh, the film The Thing. It wasn't my cup of tea, but it was a great soundtrack, and I am very familiar with all those soundtracks out there for films. Well, that's, I mean, there is, it's such a part of the movie, because a bad soundtrack, conversely, can also wreck a yeah. movie. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the film Lady Hawk. Mm. Oh, nope. yes. Yes, I'll with Rucker Hauer and now, uh, to me, the watching it now in in 2022, that soundtrack by the Alan's Parsons Project is is it kills me. It's just it rips me out of the movie because it's not just an orchestrated soundtrack, and I think the movie would have done so much better if it had, had an orchestrated mm. soundtrack. Yeah, it's a bit... What do you um, think? I wasn't too busy concentrating on the soundtrack for that film because I was trying to follow the storyline in a way, but now you saw me the Alan Parsons projects was involved, I have to really look into that now. I might have to give it a listen myself. Because my, my kids, I was so excited to show them that movie yeah. and then they were like, what is up with that, Dad? And this was a number <laughs> of years when they were, when they were uh -huh. younger, but they, they were not digging it. Um... But the thing, I think, just stands up so well as far as it it really um, brings about, the, the punctuates those themes of isolation, claustrophobia, paranoia. All mm -hmm. of those things you get yes. through the music of this movie. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, John Carpenter knows how to pick knew how to pick the music when it comes to all these films. And it's funny because he does, I mean, obviously he does, he does a yeah. lot of his own stuff. The Halloween yeah. theme, which is one of the most oh, recognizable yes. pieces of music uh, out there. He did a, a like long version of that. You can look it up on, uh, on YouTube. They, and it's, it's, it's probably a 20 or so minute version of that piece of music. And it's, it's very interesting. Which I think is actually interesting that that one, if I remember reading correctly, literally was just John Carpenter, the director, just sitting down at a piano and plunking out those notes. Like, it was not this big grand score that he envisioned, but it came about by the director just sitting down at the piano and just playing those simple notes. And now it's you you, you hear it out anywhere, somewhere, and you're like, oh, that's Halloween. <clears throat> yes. And actually, and um, on this topic of the thing, there are a couple really interesting sites on YouTube that have atmospheric music. And of course, we're doing a show we're talking about music that we can't play because otherwise YouTube will send us to YouTube jail uh, or copyright <laughs> strike us or all the other things that I'm, I'm just a simple man and can't afford. <laughs> um, but they, they'll, it, it'll be like an hour or two hours of music that is related to or from this and it just has like a scene from it up on the screen and if you're just doing something it's a nice kind of relaxing thing to to chill out with in a weird way um yeah. oh halloween kills i don't i don't know um where did that go i just saw your here it is halloween Mercurial. ends oh, halloween ends i'm sorry the uh, latest one to come out featuring jamie lee curtis that's coming out this and, year and the last Hopefully, they always um, say it's the last. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, I I was just a little kid when this. I think when did the first one come out? Nineteen seventy eight. A hundred and eleven years ago. I was there. A hundred and eleven. Yes, years ago. you're um, old. <laughs> I wasn't even. Wasn't it? I think it was. <laughs> I believe it was nineteen seventy eight, but I, I could be wrong. I often am, as as John will tell you. Um, but that movie and Halloween 2 made such an impact. Those two were, were incredible. Then, of course, came Halloween 3. And we knew what he was trying to do at that point, or what they were trying to do, the studio was trying to do. They wanted there to be different Halloween stories, and they would just call them sequels. But at that point, it didn't work because you had already done 1 and 2 as a 
continue his story and it kind of mucked it up. I think the idea is clever, but I don't think they went about it the the right way. And thus, you ended yeah. up with Halloween 4, which was not good, and Halloween 5. I think mm, maybe 6, the- then Halloween H2O. Then, and then we got the Halloween Rob Zombie the, remakes and, and, and then oh, those I don't went, count those. I think we're just starting to milk the franchise by then. <laughs> just a little bit. And now we're in yeah. phase phase three or four of the Halloween mm-hmm. films, uh, and eh, you know the, I don't know the what original. The original movie came out in 1978. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I was I, my old brain recall that you're just a wee lad. Okay, so. <laughs> I was. I was eight years old. I was. I was a. I was a little feller. Oh my God! You're so old. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, now we're looking at something that isn't really as simple as the Thing soundtrack. We're looking at the sweet epic of Howard Shore and the Lord of the Rings. And yes. Again, John, why don't you you go ahead and take this because I, I talked I talked plenty on the other one. I, I mean, this one I think we've spent many uh, we spent many an evening in your backyard, smoking our pipes, smoking our cigars, and the 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 Lord of the Rings score overall throughout the trilogy and even into the Hobbit movies because I believe Howard Shore also did the Hobbit trilogy which he, he did met with he did. much met with much controversy but we're not going to go there we're just talking about the music um when you hear these songs when you hear the music and the score from these movies like you said in the very beginning you're immediately transported back to a place you can almost kind of picture the movie scenes in your head of what's going on during these parts but I would venture so far as to say that that kind of opening theme, what is commonly referred to, the I think the track title is normally called uh, Concerning Hobbits, where they're in the Shire, everything is still bright and green and happy, and everyone's sitting around and tending to their garden and smoking their pipe weed. We've oftentimes, many times, sat in your backyard listening to these very songs, smoking our tobacco <laughs> yes. pipes and reminiscing about i remember blah blah long boring story (laughs) and whatever um to me like these these soundtracks these scores like you go into the more deep dark stuff where they're you know the ring wraiths are chasing after the hobbits and sauron and the great watchful eye and everything but to me that that concerning hobbits that little main flute riff that kind of floats in and out throughout the franchise is so it just it's very lighthearted. It kind of just makes you smile a little bit, and it um, if if I were to play it right now, like it would immediately transport me to a certain place. Like I would see a certain movie scene in my brain or something where yeah, I want to be sitting outside and enjoying the fresh air and the green grass, and it just it's a it's something that's become so iconic that it. Uh, and again, you know, being a musician, as you know, and as I know, when you write a song and when you do something, if after you listen to a song, if you're still just sitting there in your chair, it's like, okay, well, you haven't really done your job. But if you can play a song and it takes you somewhere, then you've done your job. So, uh, Mr. A.W.K., mm-hmm. uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on Lord of the Rings and its, its massive soundtrack? Very epic, and all I can say is that the music really goes along with the films. But the thing is, I'm not really a massive Lord of the Rings fan, and it's been years since I've watched that movie. So <laughs> I've really got to go back over to it. Well, but um, I have got one soundtrack that you may be interested in, but um, that depends if you want, well, you and your viewers want to know. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what this is for. Okay. Okay, if I can bring this up, uh, there's one film from the 1969 named The Italian Job, and it was composed by Quincy Jones. Oh. Yep. Wow. And So I've seen the remake, I never saw the original, I didn't even know there was an original. The remake is blasphemy. 
The ah. original, <laughs> the original is what you call a good old British Cockney, well, gangster type film with more comedy to it than the actual plot. And Quincy Jones, when he came on board to do the soundtrack, he wasn't familiar with Cockney rhyming slang. And then he learned it going along, and then he integrated it into the song. And one of those songs is called The Self-Preservation Society. And with that song, it's really how can it invested itself into the British consciousness over here. And when you give it a, lis- a listen to, you'll probably be singing along with it. Oh, that's awesome! Now I got now I have to now I have to seek this out. Um, one, I got to see it so I can get the context for all these pieces of music. But then two, then I'm going to load it into my Spotify and, and drive my wife crazy with it. So you've accomplished two things with that, uh, Alex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, the, the who, who stars in the original version? Michael Caine. Oh. oh. Michael Caine wow. and the entire British cast, and also a cameo from Benny Hill himself. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yep. So Michael Caine, so Sylvester, well, I guess it wasn't Sylvester. He he did Get Carter, which was yes. also a Michael Caine movie. And now the Italian yep. job, which I didn't know had... Was now, and I froze up. Okay. Hey, well, Devin, how are you? So go go on, go on, Alex. Well, all I could say about the Italian job is just it's it's just an iconic soundtrack, but with Quincy Jones driving the full well orchestra behind it, and also adding to what he did is absolutely brilliant. But when the song. Uh, self-preservation society uh, was created Michael Caine was one of the guys singing the song so wow. you don't really you, can, you have to really listen carefully if you can hear his voice and I've been trying to track it down for years not the song, <laughs> I've got the song but, but trying to hear his voice right oh that's really cool, that's some, that's some good background stuff, hey Zach's Uh, um, another right, film yeah. I want to bring up, if that's possible. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Listen to the main thing. There's a main uh, a film out there called The Long Good Friday. It was made in 1980 with Bob Hoskins and uh, Helen Mirren, which I recall. But if you mm-hmm. listen to the main theme from that, that that is really good. I don't, I don't know who composed it, but I know I've got the uh, song on my computer. And that is an absolute song, brilliant song. It really goes well with the film. And this is the, the Long Good Friday? Yes. I've not heard of that. Oh, the, I mean, I like Bob a, Hoskins and Helen Mirren, though, so... Yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's R.I.P. One, <laughs> it's one of those... It is, another, it is a serious gangster film. That, that's all we can say. And um, you have to be. There is a bit of terms about, um, no offence, but pissing off the Americans in a way. But uh, you ignore that. You just have to follow the story. But listening to the background music <laughs> of the entire film really gets you into that story. So, well, that, that's, someone's that's always trying doing. to piss off the Americans. That's easy. <laughs> Well, it was 1980, in the 80s, early 80s, and it was a whole different era. Well, you know, at this point, it's like everyone in America is offended by everything, so it doesn't take much. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Not everyone. Ah, yep. oh, well, you know, we're we're out here doing God's work, trying to show that we're not all offended by everything. <laughs> and yeah, we do our best. <laughs> There's one more film. Yeah, go ahead, Alex, please. Is, uh, where is it on? Uh, you've heard of Chariots of Fire? Yes. 
Listen to the main theme from that. Oh, yeah, that's another iconic piece of music that yes. you know exactly where that came from. And as you're going across every finish line ever in your life, yeah. that music is playing. Yep. That, all I can say is that it, it really plays well with the story, especially when they're doing their training and they're all running along that beach and you hear that iconic thing. See, that's just the opposite, in fact, of Rocky mm -hmm. 3, when yep. Rocky and and um, Apollo Creed are running on the beach. That music was not iconic. Um, mm -hmm. It was... It was that wasn't even the eye of the tiger at that point. I think it was some <laughs> awful. Maybe, may it might have been his brother Frank Stallone singing it, and I think it was, it was not good. It's exactly the opposite of the Chariots of Fire moment. Yeah. Um, which which was inspiring. The other was a little gaggy. Uh, not not so good. Is it eye of the tiger? I don't think it was. I don't think it was Nerd Warrior. I don't think it wasn't that scene. Um, it was, it was just like some synth crap with a, a dude singing and it, it, it was not, uh, not good. So, mm -hmm. um, but so yeah, those are, those are I, now two of those. I know the other one, the long good Friday, I don't know. And I'm going to have to check that out now too. So I have homework, which I'm, I'm okay with. I don't mind homework. So, um, now jumping forward into this and yep. i'm sorry i can't pull up graphics for all of these my computer doesn't have the capability to do so without shutting down and even then it's a roll of the dice so this blade runner which has been a topic over at wakasisi's tea house for uh he did a part one and part two breakdown of this film and they were both brilliantly done and one of the things that we discuss every single time is the music. Because the music is such a character in the movie itself. Yeah. Uh, you, you, from those first eerie tones going in, a, in the visuals, you are taken to this dy dystopian world of replicants and Blade Runners in a society that looks like it's always raining and wet and dirty. And it just, every scene has its own piece that is so appropriate and, and, and puts you in that world. Um, I think the main, the ones that everybody really knows, uh, the main title, of course, uh, and then uh, the Blade Runner Blues, which is just, you know, it's another of the many pieces on there. Uh, yeah. Tears in the Rain is one of the final pieces, you know, when uh, uh, we're, we're getting to... Um, oh, my brain just Roy stopped Batty. working. Roy Batty. Roy, thank you. Stuff. When Roy Batty's... Yeah. Good Lord, when Roy is dying um, mm. and he's holding the dove and he's giving that, that brilliant speech and... You get Deckers, and this is one of the things that I like about the theatrical release that I didn't like about the others. You get Decker's narrative over those final moments of Roy's life when he's saying, I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those final moments he just cared about all life, my life. And then Roy dies, the, the, the dove flies away. And it's just those haunting tones and just... The, the, the drawn out notes uh, that just make it such a such a special weird wonderful piece of music mm -hmm. yeah and, and I know that we've we've kind of had our conversations back and forth of how we feel about the Blade Runner 2049 and the new one and Ryan <laughs> Gosling and yeah 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 whatever but Hans Zimmer, which I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about here in a minute, but Hans Zimmer did the score for Blade Runner 2049, and I think that he did a beautiful job. And uh, here, the nerd Poriel actually even kind of said it too, that he did a really good job of staying in line with the original, kind of updating, maybe improving, moving forward something, but it just it still felt familiar. It still felt like it fit, like it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, the the score in Blade Runner twenty forty nine I think very much fit the the classic 
vibe of everything that you're describing about the original movie. You know, there are some things I liked about about Blade Runner 2049. There aren't many. Um, I actually like the look of the film a lot. I like the sound of the film a lot. Um, my the, my problems with it are Ryan Gosling, which Ryan Gosling. you and I have discussed, of course, <laughs> because Ryan Gosling plays Ryan Gosling. He's he's not an actor with a particularly a lot of depth. Um, and even smug face. <laughs> and and spoilers out there. I I actually I hated the end of the movie, and I actually kind of like was the. the Oh, I, it was just, it was so bad. It should have been so much, but you didn't care about that character. You gave two no, shits about that character. You, and that you, was, you didn't care about the character at the end of it, but I just, I kind of felt like the way they wrapped it up was actually kind of nice, but I, I get it. I understand. Like, <laughs> actually, you know, I, uh, Louis Berry, who is new to the new to the chat, and thank you for being here. You make Love an interesting it. comment, and um, Mr. AWK, I don't know if you ever saw this one. Nice guys, uh, this was. Yes. Yeah, I actually liked this movie a lot, um, and this did this did show that Ryan Gosling, when he chooses to, can actually act and not just be Ryan Gosling, even though. Yeah. In 90% of the movies that Ryan Gosling's in, he's just Ryan Gosling. See, and Zach's here. Nice Guys, yeah, Nice Guys was a good movie. Um, yeah, who knows? So it was better than I expected, but beautiful look at, I don't remember the story. That's pretty, that's a, that's a very nice summation of Blade Runner 2049. It's, it's beautiful to look at, but I don't remember the story. Um, <laughs> Oh, such a, such a waste, such a waste. But moving on, so uh, Mr. AWK, I, mm -hmm. I know you are on more of a timeline this evening than than John and I are. Yeah. Even though we are, it is still a pretty short timeline for all of us because this is just our hour our hour Thursday show. Um, did you have any other ones that you specifically wanted to bring up? Anything that we might not have considered? Maybe something weird. I like weird. Uh, well, at the moment, my computer is just resetting itself because I'm trying to work out the internet problem. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm just looking at my movie collection at the moment. Uh, does Batman Begins, or say the Dark Knight trilogy, get included? They can, they can definitely be included. That yes, that's, was... That's... Um, that was Hans Zimmer, right? Am I correct on that? Yeah. Or am I, yes. am I wrong? Yeah, it was Hans Zimmer. Oh, that's right. Yes, every as as, as John put in my notes, uh, nearly every Christopher Nolan movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well back, the, the Dark Knight trilogy, I've got to have really hand it to him because how can I put this? If you think back to what Batman nineteen eighty nine, you get yes. the Danny Elfman thing, and the Danny Elfman theme has been incorporated into like the animated series, and also yep. it's like it's a part of the conscience. But uh, but with this soundtrack, I think it's a, like a step up. But you're not actually using the original Batman theme. It's it. How, how can I, if I, if my internet was working, I could come up bring up anything about the instruments or the orchestra Oops. that was used. Hey there. Hello, you back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I did I drop you? Did I knock you out? No, I I had to like sneeze, and so I thought I was muting my mic, but I apparently dropped myself out and couldn't come back in. <laughs> <laughs> because it wouldn't be an of the Empire broadcast without something going terribly wrong. So, mm -hmm. all right, sorry, sorry, John. Uh, go go ahead, Alex, please. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll throw it. I think it was um, a lot more nuanced than the Danny Elfman work is Danny Elfman. It's very yeah. in your face. Um, whereas the other, um, I don't just want to call it atmospheric because atmospheric, I think, is dismissive. 
and it 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 it, it puts it in the background. You're, you know, and that's and that's not what I think is is appropriate. It is it was a very good soundtrack for this movie. Um, Zimmer though has done, I mean, he's done a, a lot of other. I mean, he did the Pirates of the Caribbean. He's done Dune, mm -hmm. um, The Rock, which. Interstellar, which, oh. I, which again, uh, nearly every Chris Nolan movie, I love and, Interstellar. And, and mm. what what I would say to that with the the scores that Hans Zimmer does, like yes, he did Interstellar, he did Inception, he did the the Dark Knight trilogy that Christopher Nolan directed. But like you're saying, none of those themes, as we're rattling off these movie names, none of those themes immediately come to mind of like. You, I, I couldn't sit here and like hum any of those themes to you at the time. So, mm -hmm. while I do think that Hans Zimmer is a fantastic composer and he's worked on some phenomenal movies, he's in like a different level where he has the impressive resume. He's worked on some great movies and he's incredibly talented, but they're not iconic. Like going back to talking about like the Danny Elfman version, where when Danny Elfman did the Tim Burton versions and it later became the theme for the animated series. In, in the back of my mind, I can immediately like hear that theme as I'm thinking about it. Um, the songs from Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, he did the theme for the Simpsons TV series. Like There are certain things of iconic, good, talented, and then it's like, as soon as you say the name of a film, you're like, oh, I can, I can hear the music in my brain. Hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, hmm? I don't know what I was going to put, really. <laughs> um, well, well anyway, let's, I will want let's... To... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to bring out one rare film, um, but I'll let you carry on before I mention it, um, because I'm going to type it in private chat if you can bring it up on the screen. Uh, um, I, hey. My ability to bring things up on the screen are not good. Everything I have is preloaded, um, <laughs> because if I don't, then we will come to a complete screeching halt, and something will probably catch on fire. Oh, but that's uh, why it's so fun. We'll make a montage out of it so, eventually. So go, go ahead, hit me. What, what is the what is what is the movie? Uh, Skate to Athena. Hmm. Terry Savalas, Eric Gould, Roger Moore. David Niven. Wow. Uh, Richard Roundtree and Sonny Bono. Holy and crap. All I, say, oh, wow. all I can say about that film, the music, it's got, it was set in Greece, but they have it. Lalo Shifa, oh, I can't pronounce his name properly. He did the soundtrack for it and he incorporated a lot of Greek music into that film. And it really works. Well, that is a hell of a cast. What was that? Was that late seventies, early eighties? Late seventies, going into the eighties. It's one of those World War Two action epics. Ah, oh. with Sonny Bono. Don't... That's Sonny unexpected. Bono. Yeah, like you don't get, but you don't get a film with Teddy Savalas, Elliot Gould, Sonny Bono, and Richard Roundtree about to take on the Germans. That's true. That's that is and so also, strange. And also, Roger Moore is playing a German in it, who's trying to defect. And Gr Gray, we did already cover Blade Runner. Um, that was that was I think the, one of the the, the the last one we talked about uh, was like, I think was maybe the, the third or fourth in, um, because that that like you're. That is one of that is one of the iconic soundtracks. We talk about good soundtracks. That's an iconic soundtrack. This this movie sounds crazy, Alex. I'm, I'm gonna have to. I'm now. I, that's why I'm typing it into the checks. I'm gonna have to find these things later. Um, and I'm old, and I may not remember things because he I is 111 years John, old. John, don't say it. Just don't say it. So I want to talk a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And we're gonna just. I'm gonna kind of jump through composers now because. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about, you know, so uh, Howard, I'm sorry, not Howard Charter, ugh, brain, James Horner. The words are hard. Wrath of Khan, words are hard. Words are harder when you're old. <laughs> yeah. um, James Horner, the Wrath of Khan soundtrack is so interesting. 
you when when the attack scenes are happening between the ships and you just have the high pitch John 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 left John left um it's just very intense so uh Alex are you for you I'm sure you're familiar with this one as well oh uh, we're posting a quite a few clips on my channel about it with this film because we're going we're doing something called quotes on the classics at the moment with my channel oh nice and with the Rafa Khan, we're trying to post Khan clips because of what he say, well, all the uh, quotes he keeps coming out with in the film. But this soundtrack really works for the film. And as you said about the fight scenes between the two Federation starships, and also, oh, it is yeah the 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 great space battle and the music yeah. was those two are like just married. They're so yeah. well. Uh, orchestrated together yeah especially the fight in the nebula where they're trying to stay it's oh. like an old submarine movie and you hear the yes music yes and it's actually it's reminiscent of the uh the balance of terror episode from the original yeah. series but with a much better budget and soundtrack <laughs> yeah and all, so he all also all gave us is... oh go ahead go ahead yeah, yeah. All I can say is that about it is that that it just really plays well to the narrative. Of this film. That, you know, it does, it, and uh, every piece is important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could wish I could get the words out. It's just, it, it, I can be, you could listen to this for hours and hours and hours, and still visualize those scenes in your head without yes. watching the film. That's all I can say. Yes, my son has been in a classic Star Trek movie phase, and he actually loaded the Star Trek II soundtrack into Spotify, so that's been playing in my kitchen while I've been making eggs. So, uh, James Horner also gave us Titanic, um, a, a, with some less iconic space battles, and <laughs> Braveheart, which I know is Titanic wildly historically inaccurate, battle? and... <laughs> I didn't say they were they were good or actually even existing. So, and he also gave us Braveheart, which uh, I enjoy as a film, but I know is wildly historically inaccurate. Also, a mm -hmm. space battle. Also, with no space battle. Yeah. <laughs> then it brings us to John Williams, who I think. I, and it's hard. I, I I don't know what my favorite John Williams score is. Home Alone. Um, not Home Alone. <laughs> so I would say. I mean, because he's got like he's got the big ones. He has Star Wars. He has yeah. Indiana Jones. He has Jaws. Yeah, um, do not go into the water when you hear a violin. Well, uh, a cello playing. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Jurassic Park. I would say for me, and you guys, you guys share with your do, my my. Go ahead. Did he do ET? Probably. I'm gonna I'm gonna make an admission here that everybody is gonna hate me for. I don't mm -hmm. like ET. Oh, I don't wow. like him as a person, and I don't like him as a film. <laughs> no, He's not a person. He's an extraterrestrial. <laughs> Whatever. That little gray asshole was more trouble than he was worth. I'm just wondering uh, how much the phone bill was to call home. <laughs> and that's back when you had to pay long distance. Not like today, yeah. not like cell service. He screwed that family over and then he left them with a million dollar phone bill and an unusually mm. high candy bill. That's yeah. why Oops. you hate I jumped ahead there. Oh, mm. wow. <laughs> So, but my favorite of the uh, John Williams themes is probably the Star Wars theme. Um, I like how it grabs you right from the get-go. You see those credits rolling in your head. Um, the end theme with Luke looking off at the at the, the the setting suns of the planet. Leia's theme. There are just so many good bits in Star Wars, but that that to me is. John Williams' big screen best. What do you, what do you guys think the, the from Han, John Williams? The Han and Leia theme in Empire, once they did the Empirical March in Empire. Mm -hmm. um, but here's here's how, I mean, I'll even take it a step farther. And like, here's how iconic the, the main Star Wars theme is ingrained into my brain. 
Yeah. Like some of my some of my earliest memories as a child, because I'm young enough that by the time I was born, the original trilogy was all out. Um, some of my earliest memories are sitting down and watching the original unmolested trilogy before George Lucas got back in there. <laughs> and <laughs> I have very, very early memories of actually thinking that um, the 20th Century Fox fanfare before the actual opening credits part of it was also like part of the score because like i for the longest time for many many years of my young life i automatically associated the 20th century fox fanfare with being part of the star wars theme because you saw that you had the drum roll yep. and the bah, 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 da, da, and the whole thing and stuff and then it Careful, go we're gonna blank. get copyright blocked we're gonna get copyright Long, blocked <laughs> long time ago in a galaxy far far away and then boom star wars and like as a young child, I was just like, oh, like it's it's all music. It's all every time I watch Star Wars, I hear this and then I hear this. And like I, I connected the two Ooh. because I like immediately tied all that together to that main theme. Like you're saying when the the, the, the scroll starts and it said episode four, a new hope and the, it starts crawling up the screen. Uh, that that's how ingrained into my brain that main theme is. Yeah. <laughs> What about, what about you, Mr. AWK? Well, I'm more... Uh, I am a bit of a Star Wars fan myself, but... John Williams... It's got to be the Superman theme, I think he did. Oh, yes! The Superman theme. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, it's, it's one of those that you know it when you hear it. Also, yes. also goes along well with Chariots of Fire if you're putting together a running mix. Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially Indiana Jones. I think he did, you know. Yes, yes. I, I love, I love the Indiana Jones again. That's another one. It's these are he, you know he writes super you iconic it. themes. Um, yeah, because I even love that. It's like I, I hate to say it now because I hate the way that the company is going. But until September, I'm an annual pass holder at Disneyland here in California. And boo! Boo! I know, I know, I know. Shame, shame. But I mean, I gotta say, like the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland, which mm -hmm. opened in 1995, is one of the coolest rides they have in the entire park, even to this day. They have some newer, pretty cool shit now. But that Indiana Jones ride, like you get on there, you hear the theme music, you hear everything, like, you're instantly like, I'm in the movie. And again, I grew up watching these movies, and it's, as soon as you hear the music, you're just like, fuck yeah, I'm in an Indiana Jones movie right now. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we changing the topic yet? Because uh, there's quite a few others I want to mention. But I'll let carry on. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. We've yeah, we're, we're um, down to our about our 12 minute barrier here, um, mm -hmm. but we can see how things are going. Uh, John Barry and his iconic 007 school. Ah. Oh, yes. Especially all the opening songs from classic Bond films, not the newer Bond films. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, no. So much <laughs> on the no. Um, Goldfinger. I love Goldfinger. Yep. Um, you Careful only saying that twice. out loud. You can't go wrong with Bessie. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, you only live twice was brilliant, and then mm -hmm. uh, what I did, and this is, and this is this is going to be unpopular as well because I like to do this. Um, from Her Majesty's Secret Service, you oh, had yes. the Louis Armstrong. Um, all the time in the world. Stream brain. Yes, all the time in the world, and then in. Uh, you have no time to die, which I know not everybody liked. In fact, many people did not. They they chose to close with that as a theme, and I thought that was a really interesting piece or use of that, that music. Uh, it was it was a good throwback to the day. And of course, George Lazenby. No, not everybody mm. has even seen that movie or knows that it exists. Um, because it wasn't one of the mainstream, well, it was, I suppose, at the time, but he didn't have the lasting power of Connery more. Um, the other guys I didn't really care for, uh, Timothy Dalton and Pierce Brosnan. 
I, I yep. just that, that that was it was out of my window mm. at that point. But the classic Bond f- songs were really. I mean that 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 if I we have the album because I have those. Um, we have that, and we can just sit and listen to it, and you get, you know, and Tom Jones with Thunderball. Wow. Nice. That is so good. Tom one Jones has up. more than one song. Yeah. <laughs> one song I do want to bring up, Live and Let Die by Paul McCartney. Oh, Mary. yeah. Yes. Oh, that yep. whole piece of music is exceptional. Yeah. yeah. Where can you get an orchestra mix with his band? Yeah, you've got rock and orchestra, and yeah. it's not awkward. It it's works seamlessly together, and that is that's so another good. brilliant theme song. Not not the Guns N' Roses version, never their no. version. No. Not no. Guns N' Roses, no. never <laughs> Guns N' Roses. <sighs> that I just know, actually hurt that. me to talk about a little bit. Just suck <laughs> the life right out of my lungs with that one, buddy. <laughs> Can I just uh, mention one th- one more song from Bond, if it's okay? Yeah, definitely. You know, a few weeks ago, PJ and I and Jim the Viking did a review on... What was it again? Uh, the Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me. Ah. And that iconic opening, Nobody Does It Better. And yes. apparently, with that song, the title was Nobody Does It Better, but it has no relation to the actual title. But they had to include the spy who loved me into that song as one lyric. <laughs> <laughs> because they said, Nobody's going to was... a Bond song called Nobody Does It Better. <laughs> True. And actually, that was the first James Bond movie I ever saw when I was mm. uh, a very young lad and uh, the, and, the, yeah, and that's that I, another great piece of James Bond music from a music from a franchise that I think uh, had very good music I would say up and, and actually I do I do like the Adele theme for Skyfall I think that is a mm. good piece of music I good. hate Duran Duran's um <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I wrote that last movie. Um, View to a kill. View to a kill. Oh, there's just so much bad there. That was the, the first movie was bad. Time. Oh, <laughs> I, I I I hated it so much. Um, and then the other ones after and, and like Living Daylights. I think Aha did the theme to that, but I couldn't. I, yep. I don't. That didn't make much of an impact. And. Who? Oh, it was um, not not Soundgarden. Was it Soundgarden? No, Sound no, no, Garden. no. Soundgarden did one. No, I think it was. Uh, was it Audio Slave or Soundgarden, or was it just Chris I Cornell? Was, I think it was Soundgarden. No, are you talking about Chris Cornell with Casino Royale? Was it just Chris Cornell? Huh. Yeah, Chris. Uh... Oh, we have a debate going on here. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find it at the moment because the, uh, the song was called uh don't know my name i think ah where is it <laughs> yeah it was the theme for song. for casino royale yeah oh the graduate no the grad you know i and you're you're, you're right in you know, uh rosie on on this one um mm-hmm. <laughs> i am i am not a big fan of the film but you're right the soundtrack like American Graffiti is is one of those um, Americana just yeah. soundtracks mm. that, you know, Mrs. Robinson, of course, is the song that we all know. Um, but I, yeah, I, I myself would, I'm in, again, I'm, I don't, I also am not a big Dustin Hoffman fan. Um, he was fine in Rain Man, but I don't know. I just, I, what can I say? This is another one of those yeah. things that, that will make people angry with me. Uh, um, but <laughs> I have no opinion here. I don't care. <laughs> well, one, one other soundtrack I want to bring up. I don't know if it's blasphemy to use, but it's one for the ladies out there. Uh-oh. Dirty dance in the soundtrack. 
with all those oh, uh, Misses of movies. the Empire would agree with you on that. Um, yeah. I had the, the, the misfortune of working in the movie theater while mm -hmm. uh, that movie was playing, <laughs> and I was subjected to that soundtrack for an entire summer. <laughs> I'm still did trying to get you? over it, Alex. I'm still yeah. trying to get over it. <laughs> did, did it did it really hurt you deep down? Deep. Deep down. The scars are still there. Even even wow. lower than that. It's it's much deeper. Very the, deep. The thing about that film is that when I was introduced to it, I was trying to find all the songs that were the classics, and that's what's introduced me to like all the songs from the 60s and the 50s and that. I didn't realize he was in Kung Fu Panda. I'll be damned. Oh, Midnight Cowboy. He was one of the... Oh, yeah, sorry he about was, that. Uh, he was Shifu. In Midnight Cowboy? I thought he was not... In Kung Fu no, Panda. I'm joking. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Oh, I'm making a joke. Sake. That was... I know. I thought that was clever. Apparently, it was less clever than I would have. I would have hoped. Did I just have a connection flip there for me? No. <laughs> Let's see. We don't have a ton. Uh, yeah, I know. Rip Robin Williams. No lie. Um, what else? Let me see what else we, I have in the notes here to zip watching. through. We could. Um, we could keep it going if we wanted to. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's, let's hang in there for. I was just going to ask, are you familiar with Kelly's Hero soundtrack? No, I am familiar with the movie, but I couldn't tell you about the soundtrack. Oh, that was um, Telly Savalas, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I know um, Telly Donald Savalas Sutherland. And uh, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, there, it was a tank movie. Uh, you could put it that way, yeah. It was more yes. like a heist movie. That that yeah yes yeah it's been it's been a minute it's been a minute yeah yeah because uh there was one track that was used in it called Tiger Tank that was reused in a Quentin Tarantino film Inglorious Bastards Oh really Yep So it, Tarantino it is very good with his soundtracks as well Oh yes he does a lot of Good at drawing from the past to to put a good soundtrack together, uh, with Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think each mm -hmm. one of those movies has just a, a very very good soundtrack. Okay, are you are you ready for a really unpopular opinion here? I may have already brought oh, yeah, this up me. before. I don't like Quentin Tarantino movies. Ah. Mm -hmm. And I've just well, you been know what? from the live stream. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been good working with John these last several months. But alas, damn it! <laughs> no, and, and I can see where Tarantino I, I, I is think, not I, I for like every Rosie. Did. Rosie's not a fan either. I feel like he could really benefit from having someone else edit his movies. Because there are aspects of his movies that are interesting. Like Pulp Fiction, right there. You just had it pulled up on the screen. Pulp Fiction, obviously, like, massive, iconic, super famous movie for a lot of different reasons. There are a lot of really exciting, holy shit moments in the movie. But yeah. there's also a lot of really long, dragged out, boring dialogue that I'm like, this probably could have been cut out like <laughs> see oh, I, I i completely disagree with that entire thing <laughs> Rosie um, agrees wait a minute zax zax i gotta i gotta know i don't i don't understand zax <laughs> what, what the, the fuck <laughs> you don't like feet <laughs> i uh, i don't know i'm, I'm I'm not uh, sure oh, 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 no, right I, actually, I do know what he, no, he's talking about freaking, um, Uma Thurman's freaking paws. <laughs> yes. Is that what you're talking about, Zach? I have to assume that's what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> it, it, 
I'm going to mention. I think that... I think both the feet and the dialogue are important to Quentin yeah. Tarantino's movies. Yeah. Well, I was going to mention. I still can't get over that song by Steelers Will called "Stuck in the Middle with You," and they use the oh. scene from Reservoir Dogs where he's trying to set yes. up a local light and he's dancing <laughs> by throwing what petrol over him. <laughs> All right. First, he was carving his ear off, and then. Yeah. He was going to set him on fire. <laughs> yeah. And you're just missing you stuck in the middle of you going along. And you think, oh, God, now yep. I'll never get that scene out of my head when I listen to that song. You, you know what? And you're right. That, and so now, so we, what we're talking about now is, is a, there's a big distinction between scores and soundtracks. Score. Yes. Yeah. Or. Scores are what on soundtrack locked up like a bat. God damn it! So um, <laughs> scores, like I said, Hans Zimmer, John Williams, they those yeah. are those are composed pieces where soundtracks are. And I think Rosie, you could be talking about us at this point. Um, <laughs> soundtracks are are, compo are are bunches of pieces of music shoved together to make something interesting. And Reservoir Dogs, I, and again, I but I'm a Tarantino fan as well. And, you're, and you're, 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 you're very right, Alex. Once you hear that, you can't not see that yeah. scene as as you're making your pasta or whatever, because that's that's what happens to me. But, Almost but, Famous, I think. I think, the, uh, is, I, I think the Breakfast Club is really one of the first ones to kind of like do the popular oh, yeah. music. It's a good in, yes in movies thing, like. Um, because up until that point, yeah, a lot of movies were just sort of, they would have a composer, they'd sort of have a score or something, but Breakfast Club was one of the first ones to use popular music and have a soundtrack. Oh, yes, I've got that soundtrack on my right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not just that, it's just that iconic scene at the end where you've got Judge Nelson walking along and he just yep. raises his fist up in the air as the song's going. <laughs> that is what you call and that was simple minds with the theme song uh don't yep. you forget about me if i'm not mistaken which yep. was a song that they hated to play and was very specific for that movie and did not fit into their normal style of music and then no one knew what the hell to do after that song and then they kind of drifted off into the abstract <laughs> at least over here Mm. <clears throat> so do we want to get into the um some of the yep, like either or stuff down. or uh oh you know that's a good idea yeah let's do the either or stuff that sounded that was a fun list so i know john, we're, already made up this... our, we're, we're already kind of over our hour mark we got people watching so we might as well get through the either or stuff it sounded kind of fun mm -hmm. so and john john made up this list and it's it's fun well, I thought so, you were going to collaborate, huh? but now apparently it's all on me. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I'm not fun. You're the fun one in this relationship. I'm the guy that reads lists. That's the dynamic we agreed on. Um, Is it because I'm covered in tattoos? So, <laughs> That's why I put second. everything on the... Oh. Oh, what happened? What happened? Now you're kicking yeah, me out. Yeah, keep it up, funny guy. Keep it up. Yeah. All right, okay. You're going to kick the tattooed guy out of your stream. <laughs> okay. So, either or. And these are comparisons between different composers or soundtracks. Um, and I'm not going to do a... Uh, a uh a poll just because I don't we don't have that kind of time and it's just more yep. trouble than I think it's probably worth at this yeah, point. So, I mean, unless you want to do a poll, but again, uh, I mean, Ro I, Rosie's remember, I, got, remember I have to pull myself together because I have to drive downtown and I'm having a lot of stress about that. Um, Park. That's downtown. <laughs> so, Hans Zimmer versus Danny Elfman. Longevity with a single director and unique, recognizable style. That one is easy for me. That's an easy choice for me. And I think it probably is for, for everybody here. Mm -hmm. And that is. Alex, what, do, what, do you, what are your thoughts? 
I've got to go with Hans Zimmerman, I'm afraid. Oh, no, see, I, I go with Danny Elfman, not because I think he's necessarily a better composer, but he's definitely a more recognizable composer. Mm -hmm. and he does, he's not a bad composer by, by any stretch, but he does write some very iconic movie music. Um, the Beatles used music, which I know is, is almost like talking about a child's movie, but because it's a child's movie. Uh, but it is, it does stick with you. What are you getting tired? Did you get up at four o'clock in the morning or something? <laughs> it's called Beetlejuice, a child's movie. Mm -hmm. Granted, yes. yes, I did watch it when I was a child and I probably should not have watched it when <laughs> I was a child, but, um, but I, I would also say that I think I would have to go with Danny Elfman. I, I love, I absolutely love Hans Zimmer and I love, Christopher Nolan as a director. So the two of them together, I love all the Christopher Nolan movies. I love all the movies that Hans Zimmer has done score for. However, as we were talking earlier, when we talk about Interstellar, when we talk about The Dark Knight, um, the music was fantastic and it perfectly fit the movies, but nothing immediately comes into my brain of like, oh, it was that theme or it was this whatever. Um, so he, he creates a great score. He scores amazing movies. But like you said, Danny Elfman has a very, very unique, distinct style where, first and foremost, you kind of know if you're watching a Tim Burton movie, you know that it's probably going to be Danny Elfman anyways. But even before you know Danny Elfman is doing the music, when you start watching the movie and you hear the music, you can listen and know that's Danny Elfman. I mean, Edward Scissorhands... Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, it's not really a not a movie, but The Simpsons, um, the the original, the old 1989 Batman movies. Like those are things that when you name off these things, you can immediately hear them in your brain, and it just it it has that like style of I know that's Danny Elfman just by like mm -hmm. okay I hear it it's Danny Elfman. <clears throat> Didn't Danny Elfman yeah, sing the song for? No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I've always seen, I'm trying to remember. Did Danny Elfman do that one song called Weird Science? Yes, yes. he was. He was the lead was singer. Oingo and, Boingo. Yeah. He, yeah. He was the lead singer and primary songwriter in Oingo Boingo before doing any uh, film scores or anything. So, yeah. 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 Uh, he was doing film, film, uh, well, film scores before he actually went on to do his film scores in a way. I think, I want to say like Pee Wee's Big Adventure was the first one he did. Mm. Like <laughs> no. Tim Burton approached I, him I and he was like, I anything on this. It, like uh, Tim Burton approached him and he's like, I don't know how to do film scores. And he's like, well, here we go. <laughs> 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 I've never actually seen that movie, so I don't know. Like, I, I, I probably have, but it's been so long that I can't uh, speak intelligently <laughs> upon it at all. But I know that that so was the, next the movie, movie that got him to work with Tim Burton to do Batman, the rest is history. Moving along. <laughs> okay, so this one is this one might be a little bit weirder, though, because I didn't I didn't know this other composer's name either. Is it Giancano? Is that how I'm it's pronounced? I'm not sure how to pronounce it, honestly. I don't know. G Giancino, Giancano, um, I don't know. So we have Howard Shore mm -hmm. versus... Where where is my where is my Michael? Okay, so Michael, I'm gonna say Giancano, and that's probably wrong. And if it is, I'm sure someone will let me know. So he did Up, The Incredibles, Cloverfield, Modern Star Trek, Super Eight, uh, some of the Mission Impossible films, the new Jurassic World movies, Doctor Strange, Rogue One, the new Spider Man movies, and The Batman, which. People, people were very, very excited about that score. Because um, I remember people just talking about you know, it was hard to get that out of your head after you saw the movie. Um, yeah, watch that film. Um, I, actually, I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed it. It was weird. Um, but I still liked the movie. But um, as a composer, I'm going to have to go with Howard Shore. I mean, just, and this is just me, of course. Mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings uh, films alone, I think, put him in that spot for me. 
because I know I know when I'm listening to Howard Shore and he his music provides such a change of reality for the mm-hmm. listener. Yeah. I mean, as I, as, as I was saying earlier, when you asked me about the Lord of the Rings score, like that, even just that one track uh, mm-hmm. concerning hobbits when they're in the Shire, um, mm. you hear that song, you hear that flute, and it, it takes you to the Shire. It takes you to that, that visual place. But um, I think I'd put a couple things in the notes, and maybe you'd added, what are some of the other older, like, like 80s movies that he had done? Howard Shore it was like Scanners, The Fly... Um, yes, seven. Um, he had a, a more impressive resume than I would have thought because I had never really heard of him as a composer until Lord of the Rings. But when I looked him up, I went, Oh, he's actually done a lot. Um, Scanners, The Fly, Gangs of New York, Silence oh, of the yeah. Lambs, those are Silence also of him. the Lambs, yeah. So we already talked about I think Indiana Jones and Star Wars. We didn't we didn't do a versus, but uh, we, we talked about those films. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, for me, it's Star Wars easy. Yeah, I think I'd have to go with Star Wars on that just because it's Star Wars and Indiana Jones both. As soon as you hear the themes, you know it. But Star Wars is so much more like you hear two notes and you're like, oh, that's that's Star Wars. I know that's. <laughs> So, and here's one I actually can't give you an answer to. Um, (laughs) It's Jurassic Park versus Back to the Future. Oh, no. Mm. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you either one of those. Oh. I know. I know. I know. I know. See, that, that one for me is, it's a tough one because Back to the Future is older so I have more memories of watching Back to the Future as uh, a, a wee uh, little lad. Um, yeah. However, Jurassic Park is like, uh, again, talking about it, I can hear the theme in my head. And if I think about it, I can hear the Back to the Future theme in my head too. But Jurassic Park is so much more like when you hear the old man say, welcome to Jurassic Park. And you hear the theme and when they first look up and see the dinosaurs and they're all fascinated and it's like, I think for me, it's got to be Jurassic Park. That's, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. I will have to give, I'll give it to you because I don't, I, I don't have a dog in that fight. And the last one again, for me is pretty easy because there are certain mm-hmm. movie franchises. Like I was never a big fan of the Back to the Future movies. I just wasn't. Uh, my, my missus of the empire loves them. I just, I just didn't really care. I know, I know, again, I'm not fun. That's part of my charm. So this last one, though, again, is also easy for me. So it's Pirates of the Caribbean, which I did enjoy, I would say, the first three films. And I don't know how many there actually are anymore because I stopped after three. Too many. Versus Lord of the Rings. And again, for other people, this might be more of a a challenge because I'm just not as invested in those movies i like johnny depp's captain jack sparrow i think he's a lot Mm -hmm. of fun and i think the more i drink the more i end up in that state but as something that is going to transfer trans transport me somewhere else uh lord of the rings is definitely that soundtrack if we're if you and i are drinking rum out on the back patio while smoking our cigars maybe we'll break out the pirate soundtrack next time to see how it goes (laughs) (laughs) I... And now it's, you're certainly welcome to join us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I, I feel like this one's actually a little bit of a, a, a more difficult answer for me because I think both are able to transform to transport me to another place in that Lord of the Rings goes everything from, as I've said multiple times, I'm like kicking a dead horse at this point, but concerning Hobbits all the way up to the, the darker scenes of Mordor and everything and you, you can you can listen to that soundtrack and almost see the movie in your head depending on what song is playing, what scene you're in, where you're at. Um but uh on the flip side, Pirates of the Caribbean, I mean that theme, that's another one that it's like you hear it and you like 
maybe, maybe it's just me. I'll speak for myself. It's like, I get like amped up. Like you're like fired up and like ready to go do something. And like, I'm going to go and drink some rum. And I, I don't know what it just, it's, it, it's much, it's much more of like, I actually, no, I can't even say that. I was gonna say it's much more of an adventure movie, but the Lord of the Rings movies, we're just, we're just talking about movies, not the books. Um, okay. Are also very much adventure movies, uh, but I just I think the overall theme of pirates for me is more memorable when we really get into it, because the Lord of the Rings soundtrack uh, score overall is so vast and broad that there's all sorts of different ups and downs and everything. But the pirates, like it has kind of like Star Wars, it has a main theme. And you hear that main theme and you're like, that's pirates. Like I gotta go pirates. Actually. I literally don't know what the Pirates of the Caribbean theme sounds like. Well, it's because you're old and boring. I know. <laughs> I'm a bad friend. Um, <laughs> you're a piece of shit. And on that man, note, you're a piece of shit now. <laughs> I think we are going to wrap it up because I have to get ready uh, to hit the road here in not too long. Um, mm-hmm. Going down uh, to U31. Uh, to meet up yeah, with uh, Nerd Roddick and uh, Chris Gore Max and our, our, our buddy Max and uh, Flaccid Phoenix and a whole bunch of other folks from the fellowship. So I'm looking forward to that. If I can find parking and don't run any over homeless people. So yeah. on that, so uh, Mr. AWK, Alex, give your channel a shout out. Yes, uh, you can find me on the channel F F F. SI, um, oh, sorry, I can't link it. Uh, we do a Tuesday show once a month, and at the moment, my colleague Arch Colin is posting clips. And also, you'll be able to find us on PJ Maybe's channel every Saturday or usually on the Wednesday. Uh, it's either Let's Talk Geeky on the Saturday night or his movie reviews on Wednesdays. So that's where you'll find us, and that's at noon. Pacific Standard Time for us on the coast of America. And <laughs> John, shout out your channel, brother. Uh, you can find me at the Creative Blue Collar Guy on YouTube, as well as uh, Creative Blue underscore Collar on Instagram. And I just got onto Twitter, so I don't even remember what my Twitter handle is right now, <laughs> but um, I'll be around. Um, but yeah. That's that's where I'm at. The the creative blue collar guy with the obscenely long name that's hard to remember. <laughs> we need to work on it. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank Alex, Mr. AWK, and John, the creative blue collar guy, for joining me on the panel this evening. Uh, thank you always to Rosie for showing up in the chat. Uh, always appreciated. And Zax and Gray and nerd Poriel and all the folks that uh dropped by tonight uh this was a lot of fun um and it is it is interesting getting to talk about these kind of topics on our live stream sometimes uh we we go in different directions this time this this time we actually stayed hmm. nearly politic free and that was that was something and we talked about something that we love instead of talking about something that we hate which <laughs> i do complaining Every time I'm talking about a Marvel or Disney enterprise. So thank you for joining us this week. Um, if you're, you're here, you know where my channel is. Please like and subscribe. And um, Alex, if you're not in my lineup, I'll add you to my channel for, the, for links. I, haven't, I, don't, I may no not problem. have done that yet. And John, of course, you're already there. So. Thank you, everyone, uh, for t- t- tuning in. Check out some of the interesting things that we talked about as far as soundtracks to listen to tonight. Something you've never heard of before that you might be inspired by. So, for now, we are signing off. Be kind. That was a good shot. Whoa, we're still live. Are we still Are we, live? God damn it, we're still there. Son of a <laughs> <laughs>